Welcome to The Golden Shadow, the podcast about psychology, philosophy, myth, mysticism, and mystery. My name is Aaron Rogerson. And I'm Melissa Polizzi. Today we're talking about the conscious and unconscious aspects of the psyche. As usual, we are all familiar with the concept of the unconscious, the concept of consciousness, etc. But this is a very big, very complex topic, and it's foundational in making sense of human psychology making sense of our experience, making sense of the pathologies and neuroses all of us are confronted with at some point in our lives. So the words conscious and unconscious cannot adequately capture the vastness and complexity of this topic, this idea. But we're going to do our best to kind of get into it, sort of figure out what we mean when we're talking about the conscious and unconscious and hopefully try and learn something. So what do we mean when we talk about the conscious and unconscious aspects of the psyche, just in simple terms? Well, we should probably start with consciousness, the idea of the conscious mind. And when we start at that place, we can kind of hone in on thinking about it as the the really like the subject of our consciousness is mm. what we are really most in contact with. So it's really the the sphere of our awareness and it comprises what I think is our thoughts and memories and emotions and ideas that we're aware of in any sort of given moment. Mm -hmm. And I feel for the most part that it really helps us create this sense of continuity in our life, a sense of identity. Sure. Personality even. So the term subjective in some sense is referring to this when we talk about someone's subjective experience. Yeah. We are referring to what they are experiencing from their point of view. And uh, again, this is really complicated. I, I know it can sound simple. I'm just like, your experience is consciousness. And it's like, yeah, kind of. But this, this is a very deep, deep topic. So in, in some sense, the conscious aspect of our being is the I. Mm -hmm. Or whatever we're referring to when we say I or me. Um, and this thing is only the tip of the iceberg, to use a probably well-trodden metaphor, but the tip of the iceberg in the sense that consciousness, the I, whatever is experiencing reality, whatever is saying, I am here, me, what I want, that in some sense is consciousness. And it's this tiny aspect of the individual. And it really only speaks to uh, a sort of aspect of nowness mm. of um, this story of who you are, where you've come from, what you're doing right now, and where you're going. And this aspect of our being does not include all these things that are under the surface, like trauma, for instance, or automatic processes that are happening mm -hmm. where you are processing things like hunger or yeah. drives, instincts, mm -hmm. um, intuitions in some regard. You yeah. might have a certain relationship with certain aspects of experience that make you feel avoidant or shy in yeah. certain moments and other things that make you feel really excited. And things sort of come to the surface of consciousness from somewhere else yeah I, I think maybe a good image is to think of a boat um and if you have this bird's eye view of this boat on the ocean it's like okay that's where your mind goes to that's what's obvious that's what you see the boat sort of floating along on the waves but actually the sort of vast um bigger picture is that what is is the boat what is the ship actually sitting upon and the movement and the way that the boat actually moves is, is often driven by, um, you know, the, the tides itself mm. or something that's um, kind of uh, bubbling under the surface. So this, this focus of the ship is something that our eyes are drawn to. Um, but if we were to sort of expand our vision and even think of what is existing underneath the surface of that, we might start to get a better idea. You know, there's animals here. There's 
ocean tides moving this way and that way. There's things that we even sort of like make up, like the kraken or some jaws like giant shark or something, you know, Mm -hmm. just uh, the space of imagination, all these things that we aren't quite aware of. And yet, you know, if we were to look at the picture, most of the time our eye is drawn to to the ship itself. And that's that's that image of consciousness. Right. So we can try and run through some simple examples of these aspects. Um, so if, if you and I are having a conversation right now, and when I say I, I'm referring to consciousness in some regard. Mm-hmm. What, whatever, whatever I am experiencing in this moment, I can look around the room and I can say there's colors and shapes, there's objects, there's furniture, you're sitting across from me. I can describe what you look like in some regard. This is consciousness. This is my experience. And if you were going to ask me a question, which is, how are you feeling right now? Mm-hmm. I'm going to respond and say, well, I feel I feel comfortable. I know that we're recording a podcast that, that involves a certain kind of mode of operation. And whatever is speaking back to you in some sense is consciousness. Mm-hmm. But I might be saying things and you might be noticing something different. Like yeah. you might be like, well, you said you're comfortable, Aaron, but you're sweating a lot <laughs> and you're – you're fidgeting quite a bit. Your mm. eyes are shifting shifting left to right. Mm. Um, you keep like tapping on the table and you look at your phone a bunch. Like it seems like there's something going on under the surface that yeah. maybe you're not aware of. Yeah. And so as much as I want to insist that like, no, I feel very comfortable, you're observing me from the outside and you, you might be picking on picking up on certain aspects of my experience that I'm not in touch with. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe I might get so nervous recording this podcast that for some reason I decide I need to stop. I need to start drinking like mm. while we're having the podcast. Yeah. So like, well, I'm just gonna have like a few shots of whiskey, <laughs> and you might be like, "Well, why are you doing that?" And I might, and my response might be, "Well, I just I like whiskey and I deserve to enjoy a drink every once in a while." Mm-hmm. And that's consciousness is giving you the story. Yeah. But if you know me well, you might be like, "Well, I think you're drinking because you're so nervous and stressed yeah. out, maybe." And you're not in touch with that. Mm-hmm. And so this whole this whole conversation that we have pretty regularly with other people and maybe ourselves yeah. is there's some aspects of our self or of the individual that we're not in touch with. We, we recognize that readily. And you can say, like, that's the unconscious aspect of being mm. this thing that you're not in touch with. Mm-hmm. Um, this this way in which you're behaving that you are unaware of. Yeah. This way in which you are being avoidant towards mm. something without realizing it. Yeah. So all this notion of awareness, disconnection, not being in touch with something, um, contradictory behavior, yeah. saying one thing, doing another. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's a very familiar everyday sort of aspect of this. Yeah. That unconscious uh, by its nature is something that is incredibly difficult for us to get a handle on initially because um, kind of by its nature, consciousness, you know, that which is in our sphere of awareness is really sort of dictating the the story it's telling itself kind of based on what is um, obvious to it, what it can identify um, itself to. So it will identify a more maybe positive story rather than digging deep and actually getting in touch with the uncomfortable, um, difficult emotion. So the story then might be, I'm feeling great. I'm just having a drink because, well, you know, it's Friday night. I just want to relax, you know, I'm hanging out with my friend and it's like, "Mm, is that really what's going on? I know that you have a tendency to drink when you feel anxious. And it's mm-hmm. like that's that unconscious element sort of bubbling up. But then you have that interplay that we're talking about right now between the conscious and the unconscious where there's that desire for us to keep a sense of continuity. And that continuity might be driven by I am a functional individual who mm-hmm. has everything under control. So the story that you tell yourself, the way that you explain some sort of unconscious drive gets filtered in through you know your, your active conscious awareness and out you spit you know this sort of half truth right right so we were talking last week in the podcast about archetypes Mm -hmm. we're we're discussing aspects of the unconscious another way to think of this of course it's a it's a big big topic um you know you might say anything that's not within the realm of consciousness is in the realm of unconsciousness in some regard and unconsciousness is big so Mm -hmm. another way to think of this is 
we were talking about this, you might watch a movie and you enjoy the movie for some reason. You mm-hmm. like it. It's yeah. an entertaining. You want to watch it. Maybe you want to watch it several times. And if I ask you, why do you want to watch the movie? Why do you enjoy it? Mm-hmm. What, what is it about the movie that you like? You might be able to articulate something. Like, oh, I just thought it was like, you know, enjoyable and action packed and fun and there was so much drama. But if I really push you and I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what, what is, what's, what's actually happening when you watch, watch a, when you watch a movie, when you watch a story, when a movie is good, what is happening? When a movie is bad, what's happening? And you might have trouble explaining that. Mm. We're drawn to things like the hero's journey story, for instance, is something we've talked about. The hero's journey story is appealing to a lot of people. And if you ask them, why is it appealing? They don't actually know how to answer you, <laughs> right? And that's this this whole aspect of, of the archetypal world, right. of, of the archetypes that we find in stories and fiction, in mythology, in tarot, for instance. Mm-hmm. They're tapping into things that we cannot explain. Yeah. We cannot register consciously. Like, well, obviously, it's the hero's journey is a story of conquering chaos and... That reflects our own psychology because we believe it's a good way to live as one should go out into the world and conquer chaos and then bring that order back home and uh, create a new order and then you become a better person. Like Mm -hmm. no one explains that when they watch Star Wars. Right. And that in some sense is um, because something unconscious is happening when we watch Star Wars. Mm. The same way something is unconscious when we meet someone and we're very attracted to them. Mm -hmm. And the same way something is unconscious when we have some sort of strange fear of, let's say, being in a car or going on the freeway. There's mm-hmm. something about that that freaks us out so much that we right. can't do it. You ask someone to explain it. Mm-hmm. Give me a rational explanation of why that's true. Right. And they might give you a rational explanation mm-hmm. or they, and it might be a ridiculous explanation that makes no sense. Or they might say, I don't know. Mm. I'm just afraid. Yeah. There's, there's, all, there's all these things happening all the time with every aspect of our life that is unconscious. Yeah. And the conscious aspect of us is just sort of on top of that, mm. trying to weave in some sort of narrative to maintain a sense of order or maintain a sense of control. It maintains something that says, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I yeah. know where I am and I know where I'm going. And that's, that's an important function. It's one that is incredibly necessary so that you can wake up each morning and know who you are and what you did yesterday and what you want to do this afternoon and who your parents are and, um, you know, what your job is. And it just helps the the function of the psychology. But there can be this tendency to maybe over identify with that conscious aspect um, or to allow it to sort of um, take the wheel a little bit too much. And in, in that, then we Um, might experience something that causes some level of a cognitive dissonance, you know, that doesn't fit in with my picture of myself, but you're willing and able to explain it away, thus sort of um, acquiescing responsibility to actually figuring out what's going on under the surface so that when you say, I'm scared to get in a car and drive on the freeway by myself, you know, you can be like, well, you know, I've had some experiences where I almost got in an accident, you know, and it, uh, that leads me to feel scared. It's like, well, okay, like that's fair, but maybe there's something deeper going on there. Maybe it's more of this archetypal um, environment of, of desiring control or um, needing to make sure that you're the always sort of driving um, what's happening. And and the fact that there are all of these moving pieces is just so overwhelming is so anxiety inducing that you aren't able to handle it yet. If you were to engage in conversation about it, um, you might just kind of give some of those really uh, surface level explanations mm-hmm. instead of diving sort of deeper to really see what's happening. Right. So one way that we can sort of explain this dynamic is that looking at humans from a historical evolutionary perspective, we can say that humans at some point very recently in their timeline, mm-hmm. incredibly recently, became conscious. Mm. And if you understand that notion that, you know, 200,000 years ago for humans is actually incredibly recent in the evolutionary timeline, out of like 4 billion years of life, the last 200,000 years are maybe how long we've been conscious in some sense. Yeah, You can understand that consciousness is something that really is a newcomer. It's really this recent thing. It's really the tip of the iceberg again. It's something that has just sort of emerged 
on top of this vast, mm. vast, very old, very primal structure of our being. Mm. And that's true about our psychology. It's, it's mm. true about our physiology. It's true about our psychology. Yeah. However you want to phrase it, that consciousness is this thing that is a small part of us. Yeah. Very small part of yeah. us. Um, and any way you look at it, you can sort of see evidence of this. And mm. the notion that this thing that we identify so strongly with, which is I, me, mm. like this story, where I am right now, what I'm doing, mm -hmm. this this aspect of, of recognizing that I am a thing with a body and I am different from you and I am different from the world. All of these notions that make us human is a very it's a very recent thing. And it's what's so interesting is is consciousness has sort of by design, it's something that is convinced that it's in charge. It's convinced <laughs> yeah. that it's driving. And yet it's really just a tiny little part of us. Yeah. And that's what's so interesting. Um so one serious implication of this idea that the consciousness is just like a tiny part of us is that um, unconscious, the unconscious aspect of our being is what's really in control and yeah. what's really driving everything that we do. Yeah. And consciousness in some regard is just in service mm. of the unconscious. Mm. So again, all these, all these things that we find ourselves doing all the time – and we don't know how to explain why we're doing them. Mm -hmm. The unconscious is, is driving a lot of that behavior. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the idea that we are attracted to someone, mm -hmm. for instance, that's not consciousness making a decision of like... You don't really choose to be like, yes, I will choose that person. Right, it's like right. it happens naturally. Mm -hmm. And and maybe due to some sort of personal dynamic within you, you have a inherent attraction to this type of person with mm -hmm. this kind of personality, that kind of look, but there's also something much deeper, yeah. much more intrinsic to our being that's also happening, much more archetypal. Right, right. And we, and we know this. This, is, this isn't this is a strange idea. It's the, the idea that someone is running calculations or kind of rationally going through certain sort of mathematical equations to figure out who they should be attracted to. <laughs> We yeah. know this is not true. Yeah. We, we know that the romantic attraction is one of the most powerful forces that we mm. ever experience. Mm -hmm. And we, we know that people often fall into bad situations because it's so powerful. Yeah. And the idea that people find themselves attracted to individuals that aren't actually good for them yeah. is a common theme that we're all familiar with. Yeah. And so if we're going to examine that, we're going to say, why would why would you do something that was bad for you? Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. would you be drawn towards someone who's not good for you? Mm. And people, the only response that makes any sense is like, well, I'm not really driving. Yeah. I'm not really in control here. Yeah. Th this is a good example of when there is an unconscious need that mm. is trying to be met and you are finding it um, in some type of individual environment or a situation that... Um, Maybe is trying to meet an unconscious need that's some type of shadow or repression, which is what I feel um, gives it that flavor of um, toxicity or negativity mm. and not seeing that pattern and understanding that you're playing out this cyclical um, negative um, – aspect of your being is what keeps you um, sort of continuously falling into this trap. Right, right. And what's the, the strange paradox that we experience in this kind of situation is that consciousness or reason mm. or the rational yeah, aspect logic. of us, <laughs> logic, whatever, whatever, there's all these words we use to describe what consciousness sort of does mm -hmm. is you you're talking to your your friend who's constantly getting into negative relationships mm -hmm. and you're having a rational conversation with them. Yeah. Says, you know, it really doesn't make sense what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're not being very reasonable. Yeah. And that doesn't do anything. Right? <laughs> right. It's like having a rational conversation with with this person about their bad habits doesn't change their bad habits. Even if the other person acknowledges them yeah. and says, You're right. Yeah. This is a bad relationship I'm in. Yeah. Um, you're right. I should get out of it. And it's like, good, that's settled. Mm -hmm. And then they just go right back to the relationship. Yeah. And it's like, well, why? Why, why is yeah. this happening? Yeah. And it's like, because they're not in charge. The unconscious is. And the unconscious wants something in the relationship yes. very badly. Yes. What does it want? Uh, it's complicated. But whatever, whatever it wants, it wants it really bad. Mm -hmm. And consciousness, the rational thing that's riding on top, um, 
that we identify so strongly with that yeah. we pretend is is steering the car that's in charge is not in charge. Yeah, yeah. And it'll just be like, well, whoops, here I am in the same relationship again. Yeah. Um, and we recognize this, right? We, we know this. We see this happening yeah. in other people. We see it happening in ourselves maybe less often. <laughs> we're, we're usually less willing to admit this in ourselves. But that's this interesting aspect of the conscious-unconscious dynamic. And it kind of gets into this whole like left brain, right brain mm. concept yeah. in some regard that there's a, um, a, a rational, reasonable side of us. And then there's sort of like a more below the surface, more creative side of us that's mm. kind of – um, interacting in this strange way, but we find overwhelmingly that the rational aspect of our being is just in service to the unconscious side of us. Yeah, yeah. And that's why people find it so hard to stop drinking. Mm -hmm. They find it so hard to stop smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Um, they find it so hard to find uh, good partners in relationships. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what's so dangerous about mm. it. And continuing to sort of live life in this way is um it really sort of set of setting yourself up um for a an experience of of constantly sort of feeling confused of why things maybe aren't working out the way that you want them to mm -hmm. or that you at times feel uh powerful and in control and then that's immediately sort of ripped away and um not really coming to realization of of what actually can be done in this situation by admitting and sort of humbling yourself to to recognize that there's something deeper that's happening within you. And, and it can be so difficult to acknowledge that and to want to engage with it because it often requires that conscious element admitting it's wrong or that it doesn't know what it's doing, mm -hmm. um, that something else is at play and it's time for you to figure it out. Right. So um, one interesting experiment that kind of illustrates this this concept very well is this, the interaction between the conscious and unconscious, the way that the unconscious in some sense is really driving, is really pushing us in directions that it wants us to go. And consciousness is just sort of helping it do that. It, it's the consciousness is in service of the unconscious is um, patients who suffer from like severe epilepsy in the past, mm -hmm. they would do a procedure to help them stop having seizures, which was to split the hemispheres of the brain mm -hmm. surgically. Yeah. So, so to cut the corpus callosum, which connects the left to right brain, mm -hmm. they would split it and that would stop the patient from having seizures. Mm. And I don't think they do this anymore because I don't think it's a good thing to do. <laughs> yeah. But still, they were able to run experiments with people where, this, where they had done this. The people would, st would stop having seizures and they would they would run experiments where they would do things like flash um, commands to different eyes. Mm -hmm. So they would uh, reach different sides of the brain. And on the, the right brain, they would flash a command that would say walk. Mm -hmm. And the patient would get up and start walking somewhere. And then the experimenter would say, where are you going? And then the left brain, in response, would say, oh, uh, I'm going to the bathroom. Hmm. Even though the experimenter knows they've just been flashing this walk order. Yeah. So the right brain is picking up on these implicit patterns right. in reality yeah. and it's responding to them and it's pushing you to go do things. Mm. But then when you are asked verbally, yeah. what are you doing? Right. The left brain comes in and says, oh, uh, let me give you some crazy explanation real quick. Sure. Um, you know, other, other – um, People who they were experimenting on, they, they might flash the walk sign to the right brain mm. and they would get up and they would ask him, wait, where are you going? And they would say, oh, um, I have to go get a Coke or something yeah. or I need to make a phone call. Mm. And this was a very strange observation. And what's even more strange about it and, and probably what's freaky about it is this is probably how our brains work <laughs> in some regard. Yeah. Is that the unconscious aspect of us is – driving us to go do things yeah like get up and walk somewhere and then the left brain is making up a narrative to explain why we are doing what we're doing yeah often yeah. in ways that are complete baloney like that that are not accurate yeah and so we know this and we we get frustrated with this when we're interacting with people who are behaving in certain ways yeah and then we're trying to talk to them about how they're behaving and they come up with all these explanations that actually make no sense. Yeah. And especially if you are in, let's say, a partnership with someone 
this is a huge source of problems between couples mm. is one couple is accusing the other um, sorry one individual in the partnership is accusing the other of behaving in ways that are not conducive to the relationship or are unfair or are hurtful mm-hmm. and the explanation for those, those behaviors is something that makes no sense yeah or it's some excuse yeah and the thing is that the person who's being asked these questions doesn't realize they're actually giving explanations that make no sense because mm. that's what the left brain does and right. in some sense is what consciousness does well especially if in this process they are trying to continue to deny the the core of what the the other partner is saying because mm-hmm. maybe that's a really difficult truth to acknowledge right um some part of your own shadow that might be coming forward um something that another person is really trying to shine a light onto or to to raise that mirror onto yourself mm-hmm. so you can see it and yeah. when that happens it's uncomfortable it feels bad it maybe even feels like the person is trying to be mean or attack you um, or is being unfair mm-hmm. um and that in and of itself begins that environment of miscommunication of not being able to sort of see that other perspective um and hopefully through that process, you know, the other partner can begin to see some of the truth of that. But often I feel with relationships, it's we're all sort of dancing around our unconscious and our shadow aspects. And it just continues to fuel all of these um, these issues that we definitely, see. Definitely. And that's what can be, I think, so counterintuitive um, is culturally over the last – well, maybe two, for the last 2,000 years even, but definitely in the last several centuries, we've really, really emphasized how much the rational brain or, or consciousness mm. is like all-powerful. Right. It's this thing that makes decisions. Right. And what's so dangerous about this is if you get people like me, let's say, who are big thinkers, mm-hmm. um, they get really convinced that the thinking aspect of them is somehow in charge. Yeah. And they are more ready to deny the unconscious aspect of them and mm-hmm. when there's this big disconnection there yeah when someone who thinks a lot is constantly denying that they have an unconscious feeling um some aspect of them that they're not in touch with mm-hmm. you get this gulf of um personality mm-hmm. in which they are constantly coming up with strange explanations for their behavior yeah. that are totally out of touch with what their actual drives are. Mm. And that's what's so dangerous is is this over-identification with consciousness, this over-identification with the rational or thinking aspect of our being is something that can get so unbalanced that we as individuals are completely out of touch with the things we actually want, Mm. the reasons we do things, the way our instincts pick up on things, the things that we avoid um, the things that scare us, uh, all these things, it, that's, that's what's so dangerous about this over-identification with consciousness. Mm. And it's interesting as a cultural phenomenon because it reflects um, not only the, the way that the individual behaves, which is that we tend to identify very strongly with the conscious aspect of our beings, right. but then culturally, collectively, right. we identify very strongly with <laughs> the conscious aspect of our beings. Mm. And this leads to all kinds of pathologies and um, conflict, this, this severe lack of self-awareness. And I think also it, it, it probably extreme uptick in, in just mental health issues, depression, mm-hmm. anxiety, the sense of disconnection from yourself, mm-hmm. maybe even the uh, emergence of uh, like the midlife crisis or mm-hmm. any type of crises in life where you're suddenly just like, who am I? What's going on? Um, or why do I feel so off? Why do I feel so disconnected? Um, why does this relationship feel hollow? Why can't I feel anything really inside all of these aspects where I feel like we, we, we have continuously identified so strongly with what is known, what we're aware of, uh, the narrative that we've told ourselves that, um, we've forgotten and we've left behind this huge amount of our being that is just, um, waiting to be known. Mm -hmm. And I think that an interesting dynamic when we're thinking about then this relationship between the conscious and the unconscious is to approach the unconscious realm as something that wants to emerge, that wants to um, have its presence understood, yeah. for you to see what's kind of going on, both mm-hmm. because 
you might um, have some aspects going on there that um, have been repressed and, and need to be processed, but also that maybe there are aspects of your being that are, are waiting to emerge in, in a positive way. Sure. Things sort of are building and shifting within you, and maybe there's a new tendency to want to become more courageous or more artistic, um, to take a leap of faith, and that stuff's happening uh, in the unconscious way before it starts to emerge into like your awareness. Sure. And so starting to build more of that relationship can allow you to find the strengths and the possibilities that exist in that realm, just as much as the, there are uh, the dark aspects that also need some, some healing. Right. Right. And that's, that's the concept of the golden shadow. Yeah. Right. That's right. So this is <laughs> something that we'll keep returning to over and over again is, um, integrating whatever is underneath the surface that is trying to come out yeah. is healthy and you need you really need to be doing that regularly mm-hmm. if you want to be a complete healthy individual that has good relationships yeah. yeah is letting the unconscious express itself and acknowledging that the unconscious is there and yeah. that it wants things mm-hmm. um that it feels things and um definitely yeah as you said a lot of the pathologies that we recognize um, that are so pervasive um, amongst ourselves, amongst people that we know, um, come from suppressing mm. the unconscious yeah. or denying its existence. Yeah. And then it actually does express itself yeah. in ways that we are totally out of control of. Yeah. And that's you know something you might see when someone drinks too much for instance mm, it's like mm-hmm. the unconscious is like i'm unleashed yeah and then it's like wow like joe's a really different person when he's drunk <laughs> and that shows it's like well there's probably some uh denial mm. of the unconscious going on then mm. um so that's just an ongoing process is uh having a good partnership with the unconscious yeah and, and i think we probably naturally will find that um our our capacity to really begin engaging that part of ourselves comes mm. um, maybe uh, into our 20s, into our 30s. It's really hard to do that as a teenager, um, as a young child. And, and really, like, that's kind of when a lot of the aspects of consciousness are forming, our identity is, for, is sure. forming, our narrative is forming. And as we deepen into maturity, um, we are then going to be presented with the opportunities to understand everything that we've become aware of, uh, what we've identified with. But also now we have the the psychological framework, the capacity um, and the fuel to, to dive into a deeper place and start mm-hmm. to really question why we do what we do and why we feel the things that we feel and why we act out um, when we do or why we haven't obtain some goal or lived up to some ideal that we've always had inside of ourself. Um, so for anyone sort of entering into that space of maturity, I think it's, it's certainly a good thing to begin engaging and wanting to create a relationship to the unconscious because that's where like this hub of life work really gets interesting and can right. really begin. Right. So what, what would be some practical steps or practical tools that you might employ to get in touch with the unconscious? I think I would start with um, any sort of self-reflective type of activities um, just to begin something on a hopefully daily basis like journaling and reflection Mm. as a way to give space to a part of yourself that isn't always... um, accessed throughout the day Mm -hmm. and you can say like well if i'm journaling i'm choosing what to write about but you can push yourself you can set up a question you can frame things in really interesting ways which is i had an argument with my partner the other day Mm -hmm. you know why what happened let's start to really break it down i felt unheard it's like okay then you start to like go down and and sort of break it down by layer well i felt unheard because they weren't saying the things that i wanted them to say to me that, yeah. that let me know that I was acknowledged and and if you start following that thread you might actually find that you have a sensitivity to that because when you were growing up as a child you often were pushed aside mm. when you brought something up you were unheard or maybe in some ways um not nurtured in the way that you really needed and it's playing out now in relationship dynamics and if you hadn't taken that time to really dive in and journal and and really push yourself and challenge yourself you might not have found that realization so 
that self-reflective type of work um, is really powerful, in my opinion. Yeah, externalization yeah. is uh, you know a broad term that could describe all kinds of activities, but this this idea that you have your subjective experience, right? Mm-hmm. And you think that there is something happening. Mm. Consciousness, whatever your experience of being conscious is convinced that there is a certain narrative that's at play right now. But the more that you externalize, and you can externalize just by talking out loud. Mm. For instance, something I do often is I talk to myself. Like when I'm, whenever I'm driving alone, I talk to myself a lot because I actually find that it's, it's like journaling. That just trying to put things into words makes you realize um, things from a more objective, objective perspective mm, mm-hmm. than when you're just sort of thinking. Yeah. And like journaling, for instance, you know, there might be some notion of like, well, when I, when I write, I'm just choosing what to write. It's like, yeah, maybe. But like, look at what you've written. If you journal every day for a month yeah, and then you go back over the last month and you look at everything you wrote, you might see a pattern. And it's a pattern that you wouldn't pick up on. And then it's a pattern of the unconscious that's like, holy shit, I'm really – not happy yeah and i didn't realize that until i read my entries and i can see this is coming from someone who's depressed yeah and i didn't realize that until i read it and i'm like wow this person sounds like they're really upset or this person sounds like they're unhappy in their marriage or this person keeps writing about their job Mm. in a way that seems pretty negative maybe they don't like their job yeah and that's me yeah and so this this is true for um you know, people who write songs, for instance, if you write music and you write a, a lot of lyrics, like something's going to come out that is interesting. It's mm. like it, it turns out like all the songs I write are about um, being abandoned. Yeah. It's yeah. like, well, that's the unconscious talking. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, you know, music is a very unconscious thing in that way. Yeah. But also other forms of art, other forms of creation. Yes. That's why they have people paint yeah. as an exercise to yeah. kind of say, what do you paint? Mm-hmm. Um, the, the notion of the Rorschach test mm-hmm. again is, is another kind of creative test where yeah. it's like, what do you see in this random, uh, ink blot and people will see things and they'll either see like lots of painful or kind of dark things where they might see lots of really happy sort of blissful things. Yeah. And the unconscious is expressing itself in that way. Right. Right. We're creating, um, in that case, a sort of like medium for us to work on or a meeting place even. You could kind of look at it like that, especially when we're engaging with some sort of imagery. Um, the, the use of tarot, and, and that's how I use it a lot really, is to engage um, a space of, of reflection and introspection and to open myself up to some sort of synchronistic event in which a card that I chose at random is actually showing me a perspective that I hadn't really considered. And how is that meaningful? How does that apply to my situation? How could I use this to sort of um, become more flexible in my thought and actually be open to what it's saying, especially if it makes me feel really uncomfortable (laughs) and I don't like it. Um, So those types of practices really give us the chance to engage with a part of ourself that doesn't often get to have the, the obvious conscious voice. And, and that's also where dreams come in. Um, Certainly. Yeah. Really powerful place of imagery and, archetypal symbolism and interesting um, processing from all of our life circumstances. And there we get this whole wealth of, of, of potential unconscious material for us to dive into. So if you do a similar practice of journaling every day consciously, you can apply that to dreams and write your dreams down, the ones that really stick out and mm-hmm. begin to really dive into what's going on there, recurring symbolism, feeling tones that keep coming up. Um, it, it plays that same role of getting us in touch with what's happening under the surface. Right. And as, as always, um, externalization, journaling, all, all these ideas, they apply also to other people yeah. who know us. Yes. Um, therapists, mm-hmm. you know, that's a pretty explicit example of someone's job, who it is to help you externalize mm-hmm. what you're feeling and kind yeah. of bring the unconscious things to the surface in a safe, protected way. Mm-hmm. But uh, even as simple as um, asking someone that you know who cares about you and that you can trust, what patterns do I engage in that I'm not in touch with? You know, because people who are outside of you observing you, they're seeing the unconscious driving yeah. the boat <laughs> and saying, we're going this way and now we're going this way. And they're seeing that in ways that you cannot see from your own conscious. 
perspective. Yeah. And that's what's so useful about having all these different forms of mirrors by which we can bounce off the, un- mm-hmm. the unconscious yeah. and get to it indirectly. Yeah. And, and through this process, we strengthen consciousness. We strengthen that part of ourself who identifies with the, the inner and sort of outer aspects of the world that has the continuity of our personality because you start to realize um, as, as much as you're not in control that actually um, – this this interplay between opening up to the unconscious realm and understanding what's under the surface gives the the conscious mind more flexibility it gives it the the chance to maybe stop a re- reaction that's happening in a situation and thus you maybe don't get into that same old argument you know with your partner mm-hmm. it's allowing you to actually navigate life um, in a much more smooth and um, masterful way so the idea here is not to you know give up all power to this unconscious aspect or to to somehow feel that we are inferior in nature because we aren't really totally in control, but actually that the merging of the two or continuing to unite them is what actually um, creates an even more unified version of yourself. And you really kind of can walk through life then with more of this sense of of who you really are, Um, maybe taking the next curveball that comes your way with a little bit more, um, a little bit more mastery. One of our listeners has submitted a dream for us to analyze, and now I'm going to read it. I had a dream I was getting married to a man who resembled someone I thought I knew, but I wasn't sure. In the dream, we go swimming next door by my house. While we were swimming, I remember feeling nervous about our upcoming wedding, but excited that it was happening. Preparation for the wedding is happening. A friend of my mother's is coming to do my makeup. Halfway through the dream, I realized that a groom, excuse me, the groom I was marrying was actually the man from real life who he had initially resembled. He is someone I have always found attractive, but is not the type of guy I would date. He has a reputation of being a bad boy and unfaithful to his partners. So, that's the dream. Interesting. What does it mean? Well, I'm immediately drawn to this very archetypal aspect of marriage and this this symbol that we often see uh, it culturally and personally. And we have all of these associations to... And it's very easy to think, okay, marriage, there's this deeply sort of uh, romantic element of who is this person and are they meant to be my lover and, you know, are are we going to have a fairy tale ending and all of these things. But when we step back and start to look at the dream as this symbolic realm of the unconscious that's trying to offer us insights and speak to us, Mm -hmm. we then look at marriage as um, this symbol of, of union of parts of our being. Um, so we start to apply that idea um, inward, internally. Right. So the, the wedding is a very archetypal concept. Yeah. That we, it's maybe, maybe the ritual itself is very culturally constructed, mm-hmm. but on a very deep level, this notion of the union yes. between man and woman right. in order to produce offspring, you might say, yeah. is, is something that is incredibly deep to our being. Yes. And seeing this in a dream is going to carry with it a lot of meaning. Yes, yes. Deep, deep, deep meaning that can really sort of pull us into some interesting spaces. But if we look at the marriage... Um, sort of as this this union of parts of our being, as we think about, you know, the the partner, um, the person that you're looking to to join in union with. There's some aspect of yourself that is in opposition to that other person. Certainly, there's a harmony there. That's why you're attracted to them. That's why you want to join your life to them. But often, that there's a, a sort of dynamic of of opposites that partners share, mm. and so 
This union of opposites, when we apply that to our own being, represents this birth of new possibility and transformation that some unconscious aspect inside of ourself is yearning to be known, to be seen, and to join into union with the conscious um, aspect of yourself. Mm, okay. So from there, I, I, I especially see that sort of unconscious element at play because of the swimming pool so that the, right. w- the water aspect tends to be a a symbolic uh, dynamic of the unconscious. So her and this um, this man uh, have gone swimming in the pool. So it's like, okay, we've got two sort of interesting supportive symbols of unconscious dynamic going on here. And this guy who she's um, marrying, someone who sort of seems familiar, but at the same time not, to me sort of... Um, has that sense of 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 our parts of our being, maybe even things that are in our shadow that are kind of known, but at the same time not. And there's an attraction to it. Um, or even in this case, part of her experience is that there's there's something that almost repulses her about this guy, right? That when she realizes she actually knows who he is, it's like, okay, he's um, unfaithful to his partners. He's a bad boy. I wouldn't really usually date someone like that. He gives me that sense of that cast Nova archetype. But she finds him attractive. Right. So the fact that he's unfaithful and a bad boy doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that she's not drawn to him. Yes. And that might just be a conscious realization of maybe not a good idea, mm. but something yeah. is pulling me towards this. Well, let's like if we start to dig deeper, it's like what about this sort of amplified character of the bad boy Um, Casanova type is something that we find repulsive. It's like, what is the archetypal center that an individual like that is really harnessing? And I think that speaks to someone who's really in touch with a powerful uh, Mm self-confidence, powerful sexual nature, Mm -hmm. um, very fluid in the romantic realm and can move through life sort of charming people, um, getting connected to the partners that they want to. And maybe when it's a little bit um, in shadow and negative, it's like they hurt people or they they are they're unfaithful or something like that but mm. the core of that characteristic is actually someone who's quite um quite um, masterful and really um able to dip into the the romantic sexual nature of of their being and to live that in a very true way so mm. You know, not sort of knowing the full story of this individual who submitted the the dream, I would just kind of put all these pieces together by looking at the need for this person to maybe dive into their own unconscious and really look at their relationship to um, romantic partners, to maybe a sense that they don't have that same sense of confidence Um in their own self, or maybe they feel um, kind of this desire to want to go out and and be more, um, to be stronger in the romantic world, to to show up more fully. And yet there's some sort of hesitance. It's like, how might you embody more of that, that Casanova archetype inside of yourself, kind of in, take a union of that piece and bring it into yourself because it might actually um, bring um, some balance to where you're at currently. Right, so potential. Yeah, in potential. Some sense, the, the union with this other being represents a gateway, um, a path to some sort of growth. Yes, yeah. Perhaps that, that, that gateway needs to be explored or, mm-hmm. or dabbled with. Yes. Maybe one foot through the door to see what this potential transformation into something more sexually confident or something yeah, more yeah. embodied. Yeah, more like romantically competent, maybe just more adult feeling, mm-hmm. um, more realized. And and that doesn't mean that that person would then embody the the full sort of shadow qualities of a Casanova in, in a negative sense, but maybe it brings confidence and it brings self-assurance and it brings courage. And that's actually something that her unconscious is is knows that she needs knows that needs to be fulfilled and it's sort of on display now in this really dramatic way of of marrying you know a character like this but really there might be some aspect within herself that um can merge into her current being and that's what's really going to help her have that um that sense of wholeness do you have a question for us do you have a dream you'd like us to analyze is there a topic you'd like us to cover we want to hear from you 
Contact us through a submission form, which can be found at our Instagram page at Golden Shadow Podcast. Or if you're listening on YouTube, you can find the link in the description down below. Thanks for listening. See you later. If you find this podcast useful, please consider supporting us on Patreon. These podcasts are only possible with the support of viewers like you. Yeah.